Hey, what's up? John from 7 Dust here, and you're hanging with Fred 12. Most of the amps that I've been using lately are the uh, EVH 5153s. Um, I think I've been using those for about five years now, on and off. Um, we got one uh, sent to us when we were making Hope and Sorrow in the studio, and we kind of plugged it in and never really turned it off. It just kind of was one of those things that just, it wasn't the only sound that I was using, but it was definitely one that I, was kind of a go-to. And um, each year that goes by, I find more and more uses for it. It's a, it's a super, super, super one-trick pony. Um, clean channel is pretty good on it, which is, if there's any weak spot on the amp, I'd say it's probably the clean channel, which is pretty strange being that it's a Fender. Um, it, it's not bad, it's just the, the blue channel and the red channel on it are just, they're unreal. Blue channel is, uh, it's, it's just such a cool channel, and the red channel is basically the same thing, just with all the, you know, the hair and the fuzz on it. Um, it's definitely one of the most high gain amps I've ever played. Um, vulgar display of power for sure with that thing, but uh, it's just a really, really cool, um, it's, a, it's a modded Marshall. It's an old modded Marshall. It's, it's like that Van Halen tone back in the day. I mean, I, I kind of cut my teeth playing Marshalls and gravitating towards that kind of a sound. So for me, it's, a, it's just a natural thing, you know, when you play it, it just kind of feels like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I love them. It's hard to really explain other than the fact that it's almost like everything is EQ'd this way. Um, everything has more definition. Um, it, it's, it's really tough to put your finger on it, but it's just that there's, a, there's more clarity with what's going on. There's, um, there's so much gain on tap, and I mean, you can get it to the point where you've got it just gained up where you can't even control the thing, but you can still hear the individual strings in there for some reason or another. It's got a lot of detail, so. Um, it's very Saldano in a lot of ways. I mean, it reminds me of the SLO um, a lot. Um, it, it's very, very related to that. Um, I, I think the Randalls are a little darker. I think the EVH tends to suit what we do tuning-wise a little bit better because when you tune down super, super low, you know, I mean, I guess most people say, okay, get, get a super, super heavy amp and get a guitar that's got a lot of low end, a lot of bass, and then tune down to A and everything sounds like mush, you know. So for us, it's almost like digging clarity back out of being tuned down so low is a, it's a constant struggle, you know. It's always a bit of a challenge. So when you get an amp that has that there and you don't really have to go diving at the EQ for it. Um, the cool thing about that amp, too, is the fact that you can put the EQ pretty much wherever you want. You know, it's all just slightly different versions of the same thing. You know, the EQ, if you don't like the tone, don't dive at the EQ, turn the amp off, go play something else. <laughs> it's kind of one of those deals. It's like the EQ is only really going to modify kind of what's there. You're not going to get any drastic changes from it. They all work, but, um, you know, it's a trick you either get or you don't get. Live signal chain is, uh, it's simplified over the years. I still run a GCX. Um, we got that going just to kind of isolate things, but most of it is pretty much, um, it's pretty much guitar, cable. I had a boss tuner on the front end of the rig. Uh, we go into a wah, and then we go to the, uh, go to the amp, and everything else lives in, um, you know, lives in the, in the GCX and independent loops. I got a phaser and, we have a delay pedal set up in there. Um, I have a compressor. I think I have a boost pedal in there that I don't even know what button it's on now. We don't have that label. We, we had two different GCX pedals and now I'm back on my main and we kind of redid some stuff. So, um, but it, it's simplified, you know? I mean, I got to the point where when, it, it'd be weird, you know? I mean, you go in to do a solo on a record or play a part on a record and, you know, the engineer would be like, so do you want to hook a pedal up or anything? You know, I just show up, guitar, cable, boom. Um, so yeah, I mean, as, as close to that as I can get, I think the better off. Um, it's just less stuff to keep up with, you know. The nice thing about the GCX though is if something goes weird in there, it's usually out of the signal path. Like I don't notice it. Um, if something were to, you know, get weird with pedals out on the floor, 
you know, you dive down and you're doing the whole, hey, I'm cool, I'm not really supposed to be down here doing this, but hey, I gotta fix it. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the GCX is probably the most advanced thing that I have. Um, I do have a drummer uh, gate that is a killer gate, and um, I just run it in the loops on both the amps. I have one per side, and it just kind of cleans up any ex, you know, extra stuff. We have a gate on the front of the amp that controls the guitar, and then we have a gate in the loop that basically kills any kind of wall noise, anything like that, so. Same rack, but we've only got the two heads. Because we've actually got to the point, we were using two heads for the longest time, and um, one sounds better. Okay. I don't know why, but it does. Yeah, for some reason or another, we just, I think we went down to a half stack for one show, and um, we just started running half stacks. We did music as a weapon. We're out there with corn disturbed, and you know, we had the scrim set up, and we just had the single 412 and one head, and everyone would be tripping out over the guitar tone, and be like, that's it, man, it's a half stack. And then Michael was like, no, it's not. I'm like, no, I'm telling you, it's just a half stack, you know? So it's kind of nice um, being able to dial it in that quick, you know? It's always, I always kind of go for the, oh, well, you know, you want the stereo sound and all that stuff, but there's something really cool about just plugging straight into an amp in the cabinet and having it just come together, you know? So that's kind of, it's kind of our mantra lately, I guess, you know, simple. Real stupid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it has a lot of advantages. I mean, number one, it's, it's great for our openers because we have a whole clear deck that they can use, you know. Um, but that's kind of how we jam. Like, when we rehearse, we don't set up, you know, facing out like we're on a stage. We always set up kind of around each other, firing in at each other. Um, so it kind of plays off that, you know. I mean, it definitely helps uh, the front of house engineer. A lot you know you don't have that guitar you know just ripping your face off because a lot of the clubs that you're playing in you know it's not that far from where the amp sits to the back wall or front of house or the parking lot outside you know so anything that we can do to kind of you know have it to where it's not coming off the front of the stage another advantage is LJ can hear a little bit better this way you know everything's not coming from all the same spot you know behind him he's kind of surrounded by it you know and he can pick and choose what he wants in his wedges because he's not on ears. He's the only one who's, you know, still using wedges. So, uh, I mean, it, we love it, you know. And we, we did it, and then we were like, ah, oh, you know, we need to go back old school, do it normal. And we did it old school, and we were like, man, we just didn't like it as much, you know. Um, the back line has a cool look, I guess. You know, we talked about throwing a bunch of cabinets up there and doing that. But I think between Black Label and Slayer, they kind of got it covered. So <laughs> we'll just go with the clean deck for the time being. <laughs> Not a whole lot. I mean, we had a, we had a couple different um, setups. We had the little drum room set up, but we had a smaller version of Morgan's main kit, and that was kind of our getting our shit together kind of writing room. We'd go in there and we'd bang stuff out, but the amps were always on just dollies that kind of rolled around with us. They followed us around. If we were in the main room tracking, we'd roll it out, dollies in, plug them into the cab. Um, if we were out in that room, we'd plug into different cabinets and, you know, we just had a different monitor. Everyone was on ears, you know, headphones or ears, depending on what you wanted. Um, and then we do the same thing with the regular tracking of the big drums. So big drum set, little drum set, and then the tracking room. So these little dollies with the amps would just kind of float around wherever we were at. Um, and it, it was pretty much just our, you know, I think we used the diesel, we used the EVH. Um, we used to marshal for a few things, a couple PVs for a few things, but the lion's share of the work was all, you know, diesel and EVH, and uh, that was it, you know, pretty simple. Small guitar boat. You know, people come in and be like, where's all the gear? <laughs> be like, you know, we kind of only bring the stuff that we know that we're going to use and that, that we know that we're going to need, you know. I mean, we've, we've done records where we go through the, you know, the Johnny K record's a great example. You know, we played, I probably played 100,000 amps that day, you know. But at the end of the day, I ended up playing my EVH and yeah. kind of the go-tos, the ones that you kind of know. So, you know, this time around, we just said, you know what, we kind of know what works, you know. Unless there was something that was just absolutely killing us to try, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, it's just a way to get your sound. If you know how to get your sound, then, you know, we were more concerned on kind of jumping into the record and just kind of getting to it. Black Out of the Sun was cool. It, it was unique in the fact that we took 
the longest break we've ever had in the history of the band before we made it. Um, we had two side projects released um, before we, you know, made this record, um, which a lot of people were, you know, speculating, this is it, that's it, it's the death rattle, Seven Nuts is over, um, which couldn't be anything farther from the truth, you know, it just, it finally got to the point where when you have a break that big and you've been wanting to do something for 10 years, you go, well, here's my opportunity, you know, it's not going to come twice and I'm wasting time by sitting here, you know, talking about it, I just got to get in there and do it, so um, it was a cool experience for us going into the studio because of like I said all the side projects and the long break but what was really unique is we said let's not bring anything in like don't show up with demos because we're not going to listen to them you know write all you want but that's not what we're going to focus on you know our whole thing was let's let's do what everybody says you can't do write a record in the studio together you know all together around a little writing station and then we would just hammer it out and that's pretty much how we did it you know, we didn't show up with anything. You know, on a Monday, we'd be tracking and we'd have no idea what we were going to be working on on Tuesday because we hadn't got there yet, you know. And it was really cool. It was like, um, you know, I think after taking a break that long, we realized we, it was, we missed it. You know, I mean, we, we almost had to take it away from ourselves to get to the point where we realized, yeah, okay, our heads are, you know, because sometimes you, you lose focus and you're not sure if you're doing it for the right reasons or anything. And when you take something that is your life, you know, away for a minute, you really appreciate when it's not there, you know. So when we hit the studio, we were just, we were ready to go. And if one guy wasn't into it that day, well, the other four damn sure were. So you figure the odds of out of five people having at least three or four that are really, really, really hyper creative that day, it's an easy way to make a record. You know, I mean, everybody in this band contributes and writes, so there's never a shortage of ideas or, you know, stuff that's just going to get thrown out there. And all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I never would have thought we'd be here, you know, 30 minutes ago. So it was cool. You know, I mean, every day it was like, what are we going to do today? Crack a beat. You know, let's do something really heavy. And then we'd write the lightest song on the record. <laughs> You know, it always worked that way. It was like, yeah, we want to do something like Super Omega over the top and, you know, Dark AM comes out. And we were like, how did that happen? You know, but it was just a cool record in, in the fact that, that we, were, we were prepared to work, but we were as unprepared as we've ever been to start because, you know, we just didn't bring in a lot of those ideas that we normally would. You know, normally there'll be a whole stack of ideas from Clint and a whole stack of ideas from me. And... We start picking through one pile to the other pile to the other pile and you start putting it together and Vinny will have a different idea for middle eight and LJ will have a, you know, an idea for the chorus and, you know, you mold it into something. And that's, it's, you know, it's always worked for us, but some of the coolest moments are when we don't have anything ready at all. And we just start being seven dust, you know. I mean, we, it's funny because we do a headline show and I think we're playing 12 or 13 songs, but we're still playing all this extra music because we do these intros and outros and like just weird things and that's just part of like what happens in the room with Seven Dust. So, you know, for us it was a, it was a breath of fresh air just because it was like, it kind of took us all the way back to the beginning. It was like, I remember a time when we didn't have a whole pile of songs ready to go, you know, and that's kind of what it did. It, it took us back there. So, a lot of people say it reminds them of, of some of the earlier records, you know, the first and the second record, but I guess we were in that mindset because we're just reacting to each other, you know. Morgan will play a drum beat and all of a sudden a song will just fall out of nowhere, you know. And he was like, all I did was crack a beat. I'm like, yep, that's all you got to do. <laughs> Sometimes it's all it takes. <laughs> 28 days, you know, in and out. 28 actual days. We were there for, I think, 31, 32 days. And, um, you know, halfway through the third week, we were well well into vocal mode i mean we were deep into vocal mode and you know we just kind of we didn't really say anything to each other we just kind of went with it you know and just kind of kept a smile on our face it was like nobody's arguing with each other we're not fighting no one's freaking out over the songs yet because it's inevitable at some point someone's going to start you know all right maybe maybe this chorus sucks or that's not good enough because we're overthinkers we all overthink everything and um, the beauty of this record is we, we didn't give our, you know, we, we had no time to do that. There was no extra time to sit around and go, you know, do I hate it? Do I like it? In five years, am I going to hate it or like it? You know, so there was no second guessing. You know, a lot of records we've made, we've had too much time. 
you know, too much time is almost as, you know, worse than not having enough time because you just, you sit there and you overthink everything, you know, and you'll analyze it. And with this band where there's so many very strong, you know, minded songwriters, I mean, <laughs> we try to do a cover song. I mean, we can't even get in the same, you know, genre of music, much less, you know, agree on something. It was like, y'all can't just agree on a cover song? I'm like, no. <laughs> we tried. It was probably the closest thing we ever came to actually having a fight in the studio was over the cover song. Nothing of, you know, any significance whatsoever. But, yeah, it, it was just a fast experience, you know. It's just, it was, uh, you know, we didn't do it to say, okay, we're only going to do it in a month. We just said, let's just go in and see what happens. You know, if we get five or six songs at the end of that time and we have to go back in the studio, cool. You know, we'd done it before. I mean, Animosity took us probably a year, maybe 14 months to make in nine different studios. You know, we had labels telling us, well, you need to finish this song and, you know, this demo song needs to be worked on. And, you know, you got a lot of cooks in the kitchen, a lot of people placing their orders. And Animosity is a great record. We love making that record. But we made this one with a lot less stress, <laughs> a lot quicker. So, you know, I think we'll probably end up trying this kind of a, a process again until it doesn't work. You know, we're kind of one of those bands. We'll, if we find something that works, we'll do it until it either doesn't work or we don't like doing it anymore. So I could definitely see us hitting the studio like this again, you know, maybe spending a little bit longer and maybe doing it. And uh, the one cool thing about going to Butler, New Jersey, was we'd never been there before. Um, and it's not to knock them by any means because I'd love to go back, but there is something cool about going to a place you've never been to. You know, it kind of just, especially if it's a good vibe. You know, like Butler was a great vibe. It was really easy to work. I mean, a lot of days we were getting out of there. We'd, it'd be 8, 30, 9 o'clock. We'd be like, shit, man, let's wrap it up. You know, we'd get eight or nine hours worth of work and be like, you know what? We knew we had a good solid day in, so let's not push it, you know. Especially once we got into vocal mode, you know, because there's only so many constructive hours you're going to really be able to get out of your singer, you know. I could sit there and play guitar for eight hours, but nobody wants to sing for eight hours, you know what I mean? So you got to pick and choose, get into a rhythm. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, this band is just the best at, at being able to bring the best out of you, you know. You may be dragging ass and just not be your day, and Clint will play one riff, and... LJ will sing one thing and all of a sudden the light bulb is this big, you know, so we all kind of feed off each other. So I could definitely see us doing it again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Call Me No One and Projected were the two projects that we did in, um, in the off time. Uh, Clint had done an HDMS thing, which was more of an acoustic based thing. He did it as a, uh, I mean, he actually did one EP where he played everything. So. Um, he wanted to do something a little bit different, and we were kind of talking about what we were going to do in, you know, in the break, because it, it was a pretty long break. Um, and, it, you know, they'd been talking about doing the Call Me No One thing, and I'd been talking about doing something at some point in time. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know who's going to be involved in it. I didn't know if it was going to be, you know, Omega Heavy or if it was going to go a little lighter, a little more commercial. And, uh, you know, I started digging through a bunch of music kind of towards the beginning of the end of Cold Day Memory, like when we knew the album cycle was winding down, um, kind of started digging through some stuff and the whole idea with Projected kind of started to form. And it had been something that I had talked with, you know, Scott Phillips for years and years about doing. Um, we were eventually going to do something. We didn't know what it was or when it was going to happen, but somewhere in between Alter Bridge and Creed and Seven Dust and, you know, whatnot, we'd be able to find a time to do it. And the planets lined up for once. You know, because like one week later he was heading out to do the Creed stuff, you know, so we had a very, very small window, small, you know, window of opportunity. And it was, uh, it, it was cool. It was, it was just something that we just agreed to do. We didn't spend a lot of time overthinking it. We didn't rehearse at all. I mean, the only rehearsal we did was to sit down that day. I mean, Flip did his homework because he listened to the demos and he had a lot of ideas on how he wanted to approach, you know, when I present a demo to a drummer, it's don't da don't da don't da. I mean, it's about as basic and simple as, as it can get, you know. So, he had, he put his thing on it, but he's got a music stand, and he's got sheets written out and everything. And I was like, whoa, wait a second, you know, he's schooling me there for a minute. But uh, but it was cool. I mean, we went in there. I mean, we got it all knocked out, you know, most of the loud stuff in less than a week, and 
we shut up shop and moved over to my house and, you know, made the record. It probably took about a month, month and a half to finish it over there, um, over in my home office. And then we took it back up to uh, what used to be Paint It Black and now is Studio Barbarossa. Um, Elvis Basquet helped us out, mixed it up, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was an experiment that went well. You know, sometimes those things don't go so well, and this one went really well, so we were pretty happy about it, you know. Got a lot of new music for another record, too, so that's uh, on the plate, kind of sitting there, kind of sorting through, trying to figure out, is it too heavy, is it too metal? <laughs> You know, when we did the projected thing, it was, it, the funny thing is the four guys in the band weren't actually in the same room in the same state until like six months after the record was written. You know, everyone was like, how does that happen? I'm like, well, you know, when you're in the studio, you don't have to be there with everybody as you're tracking the stuff, you know. We, we did it old school with projected. Drums go down first, guitars go down next, bass comes in, and then, you know, E-Rock would put all his stuff over the top of it, and then we put the vocals in. Uh, we did Cold Day Memory, we pretty much did the same kind of a drill. And with Black Out the Sun was the same kind of a drill. But it was cool how we did Hope and Sorrow and Alpha. Um, you know, we jam live, you know. If, if we were all playing together and I blew the ending of the song, Morgan would be real mad at me because it might have been a great drum tape. But it was like, nope, we can't use that one. You know, we weren't so strict about it. It was like if it was a really, really badass take, we'd be like, all right, you know, we'll cut him some slack on that one. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of cool to get to the point where you rehearse things to the point where you're super, super comfortable. But this record was almost the opposite. It was almost, we wanted to go off whatever our instinct was gonna, you know, have us do. So it was kind of like, I think every band goes through these things. You know, Metallica was talking about doing records where, you know, you edit things to death and Pro Tools things to death. And then there's other records where you try not to do as much of that. And I think Blackout the Sun was our, you know, experience with not overthinking things, not over, doing stuff um, because there's a real fine line like okay we kind of know the song but we kind of don't know the song how many times do we rehearse it before we're like okay we know the song you know I mean on home I think we did everything five or six times in one day every song one after the other after the other after the other and then we did another day of all that and then we went and tracked it and put it all in Pro Tools and it ended up not being live anyway so I was like what was the point of all that you know <laughs> if you're gonna do it live do it live you know I mean, with Alpha, it was, it was cool, too, because we had, the cabinets were in the same room as the drums. So if somebody blew it, you heard it, because it was going to be in the overheads, or, you know, it, you couldn't get rid of it. So that, that, that was part of the deal with that, you know. I mean, you could play Smoke and Mirrors and cover some stuff up, but some of the stuff wasn't so easy to be covered up. But, but this record was just a little different because we weren't, I mean, honestly, some of these songs, we're still like, all right, how am I going to piece all this together? You know, some of the more misleading songs too, like Got a Feeling is just a technical nightmare because there's two guitar parts and a vocal part that happened on the last chorus and I haven't figured out how to marry all three of those together. You know what I mean? So, but it's, it's, it's cool both ways, you know. I, I like doing it where you get in there and, and we do it live and we know it. But I also kind of like the mystery, you know, the working off your instinct. The, okay, I'm out of my comfort zone. I don't know what I'm doing right now. Me and Clint Track are looking at each other, you know. Clint Track looking at me going, what's coming next? I'm like, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm glad you're tracking and not me. <laughs> it, it's similar. It, it's a lot the same. Um, in certain aspects. I mean, there's certain aspects of what we do with Seven Dust where, you know, depending on who's covering what vocal part, whether he's ad-libbing it or not, a lot of what either Clint or myself will be doing will actually be a lead part for a moment. So sometimes you almost have to approach it like, okay, you're the lead singer, act like a lead singer for the moment, everyone's gonna duck in behind, LJ's gonna do his thing, and then you kind of come back in just to the normal drill. So, I mean, we, we kind of pick and choose moments where we do that within Seven Dust, but it's a totally different thing to when it's like you're on and that's it, you know. I mean, the one really strange thing about the, you know, the projected show that we did was E-Rock had time to get the guitar stuff down, but he didn't really have time to get a lot of the vocal stuff down. So I was like, okay, this is going to be extra new, extra weird, but extra exposed too at the same time, you know. But it, it's just a different animal. I mean, it, it's, it's a totally different... Um, I have all the respect in the world for singers, you know, because 
I could break a string, grab another guitar, amp blows up, cool, I got two or three more of those. Cable breaks, no problem, you know, you lose your voice, you know, what are you gonna do? And uh, it's real easy to lose it when you're out here. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the little things, the things that like most people don't really think about and talk about. It's the, you know, you gotta kinda take care of yourself to a point. I mean, there's certain people that are like, you know, just superhuman, like Lejean. He just, he never loses his voice. And he can hang out, not that he does, but I mean, he has no problem in hanging out until four or five in the morning. And he'll get up and do it the next day and he'll just be the most resilient, durable guy in the world, you know. Me, if I kick it too hard, once or twice, lose the voice, I don't know if it's gonna come back, you know. So, there's, the, I mean, I have the utmost respect for, for that, you know, the fact that I can't just do what I want to do, you know, I have to actually think about it. You know, talking with Miles, he was like, yeah, it was like, this, this part sucks. <laughs> it's like, you got to get sleep, you got to drink water, you know, you're doing, what, five, six in a row? What happens if you lose it on the fifth or the sixth one? Oh, it's cool in seven to us because you got five guys in the band and you're not the lead singer, but with Projected, it's different. You know, you got to approach it totally differently. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's cool in the fact that I've had a lot of, you know, a lot of training, so to speak, riding shotgun but behind one of the best singers in, in the game. You know, Lejean's thing, his gift for what he does vocally is only surpassed by what he does when he's not singing. Because there's one thing about being a front man and being a singer, and then there's another thing about being the guy who's running the show. And Lejean just runs the show, you know, when, when we're not jamming, you know, we just kind of stand back and let him do his thing. And it's never the same thing twice, you know, but he just has a, he has a way of connecting with the crowd and with the people that's just, it's just him, it's him being genuine, you know. And Mark and myself, I remember we were having that, that talk about, well, what kind of a singer are you? Are you the mystery guy? Are you the joke teller? Are you the... You know, it, I wasn't worried about what I was doing when I was singing. I was worried about what was I going to do when I wasn't singing. I was like, wait a minute, what's my stick? What's my thing, you know? But you don't know until you get up there and you do it, and then whatever you do becomes your thing, you know? But the more you do it, obviously, the better you get, and I've done it once, so it's all up from here. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, a D-shaped neck, long scale neck, it would be perfect. And uh, that's pretty much what we've done, you know. I played, a, I played a couple of the stop models for a while to kind of get my head wrapped around, um, you know, just what they can do guitar-wise. And, um, you know, between the, the shape I was going for and being able to really kind of just dive into to making it exactly the, the way that I've always wanted one, you know. It's kind of a no-frills guitar. I mean, it's, it's, it's super basic in a lot of ways. Um, but it's just, it's comfortable. It's the combination of the body that I've always loved and the neck that I've always loved. So both hands are real happy. <laughs> I've got, yeah, I've, I'm actually using one of the short scale guitars, um, one of the Gibson scale necks on the highest tuning, on the C sharp tuning, because that one's a little more, um, it's a little stiffer, but it's a little higher too. Um, the cool thing about that, you know, it's weird. It's like you know, people ask me all the time, they're like, why don't you play baritones? I'm like, because I don't feel like playing something that's that long, you know? I mean, it's a lot longer, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't play bass because bass is uncomfortable, and baritones are kind of uncomfortable. They're just not, you know, they're, they're not super conducive to, okay, you know, I, I feel good about this. I'm, I haven't played baritone enough, but going one direction towards a baritone with the scale length is just enough um, when you're down in A sharp and B it just fights back enough, you know what I mean? Like to, everything is just a little bit better because of the added scale length. I'm, you know, I'm sure it's obviously because it's longer, um, but it's just enough, you know. Um, I could probably sit down with a baritone and get my head wrapped around it. I mean, when we're in the studio, we'll sit there and you play it for three or four hours and it starts to sort of come natural, but soloing on a baritone sucks. <laughs> it's just not easy, man. <laughs> You know, for a new album cycle, usually we'll do anywhere from three or four days, and most of them are tech days. You know, new crew guys coming in, getting their heads wrapped around the tuning, strings, you know, how we like stuff, how stuff is set up, you know, who's taking care of what and all that stuff. So for, it, it drives a lot of crew guys crazy too, because we'll, you know, they're like, so you're going to run the whole set tomorrow? We're like, well, sort of. <laughs> we'll start every song. We may only get 15 seconds into the song, but we'll at least show you you know transitions and stuff like that so for us that's kind of what we do since we live everywhere um practice on the road really kind of depends on where we are in the cycle and what's going on um i mean we've been so busy lately that you know when i do get a chance to grab a guitar it's you know it, it hasn't been as quality you know practice as i'd like it to be but i mean once i'm once i kind of get up in mode when we're out on the road i mean it can go anywhere from you know that 30 minutes a day minimum to, I mean, there's some days where I'll play for four or five hours, just depending on what's going on. And then there's other days where I'm writing, which I guess technically still, you're on the clock if you're writing, but you know, there's other days where I might not actually be doing anything that's technically challenging. I might just be playing music for hours on end. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's just kind of hit or miss. Right now, like I said, with it being as busy as it is, we've been sleeping a lot on our days off. <laughs> sleeping and driving and traveling and being out west. But yeah, I mean, you know, I got a micro cube that always sits in my bag and is always ready to go. And there's always a guitar within, you know, hey, look, there's one right there. I don't even know if it works, but we can jam it. <laughs> uh, Gojira, been listening to a lot. Um, let me think. Tesseract, I've been listening to um, a good bit of that. I've been listening to Civil Wars a lot lately. Uh, Lejean has been listening to anything that will absolutely drive us crazy. Um, it's that new thing. He, he's into whatever's like really popular, so you know, he's like the world's best A&R guy. If he hears it and loves it, it's gonna be a hit. We're kinda in that mode where we've been listening to a lot of demos like stuff that we get out on the road, so, and a lot of it's really not that good, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not real sure what we're listening to, but we're listening to a lot of stuff. <laughs> we were, I mean, we talked about a million different things, but the, you know, it, we came close. We thought we were gonna be able to do Alice in Chains, that we'd do Alice in Chains Wood, and uh, Elder just wasn't down with it, man. He, he was, he was, he seemed like he was fine one day, and then the next day he was just not into it, you know. But that's the thing is like, you know, he's the one who's got to get in there and sing. And he was like, it's not easy shit to sing, man. He was like, fucking, 
you know, Lane's kind of not his normal vibe, you know, so I don't know. Somewhere between us all being metalheads and being into, you know, all those kind of bands and LJ being more of an R&B country guy, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of latitude over what we could cover, you know. I mean, there's a lot of songs that we could possibly do, but trying to get five people to agree on one is not easy, <laughs> not easy at all. A marine biologist or a professional race car driver? <laughs> I don't know, man. It's tough to beat in and out burger. Every time we go to California, we get in and outs. We don't get in and out back east, so that's probably one of the more memorable ones lately. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, probably in and out. Uh, I mean, as ridiculous as that may sound, you know, we're stuck with Steak and Shake and Five Guys back east, so we see in and outs and we don't care. A line can be around the block. Hey,